Well, I am so pleased to introduce our next panel, which will explore the business case for data portability. A great deal of progress has been made by industry over the past many years in this realm. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing some of the industry perspectives about how some uh, existing obligations and new obligations, uh, expectations, uh, how they mesh with the real <laughs> practical world of technology design and business operation. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce, introduce our panel. We have moderator Mark Scott, who is the chief technology correspondent at Politico. Melinda Claybaugh, who privacy policy director at Meta. Uh, our, the wonderful Chris Riley, executive director of uh, my boss. <laughs> um, and Kate Charlotte, director for privacy, safety, security, at Google. Uh, thank you all so much and take it away. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, Delara mentioned, I'm, I'm Mark Scott. I'm uh, Politico's Chief tech, tech Correspondent. I'm based in London. Uh, I appreciate the acronym of DMA, DSA, GDPR, and all the other European things we discussed this morning. It makes me feel at home, so thanks for that. <laughs> um, so we're going to get into some of the business case uh, for data portability, which I think builds on the last panel, which sort of laid, laid out some of, sort of the academic sort of um, elements to what this all means. I, I just want, because we have um, representatives from Meta and Google on the, on the panel, just kind of go through some of the, the basics, right? Because I was reading, Melinda, the, I think the 2019 data portability white paper you put out on the Metro this morning, and it sort of lays out a lot of the things, but we are now five years on. C can you just walk me through and what the people here and, and, and what in the live stream exactly what that means for Meta. And I can, in terms of you have been doing this for a while, we'll get to the DMA later on and what that means going forward. But from, from Meta's perspective, what, what is the business case for this? I think it's on. Okay, um, great. Thanks for the question and, and thanks for the organizers for, for having me. Um, so I think it's true that we've been focused on data portability for years now. Um, and I think what we've seen um, really data portability is an outgrowth of just the concept that people have rights um, around their data. And that's something that, you know, I think as consumers, we all know that we've come to expect um, that we will be able to access and delete and share and port our data to different services. I think where it gets more interesting um, is around what does that actually mean in practice? And so you referenced our 2019 paper, and that was really looking at depth in more depth at the questions that need to be answered to make data portability a robust and meaningful meaningful, um, uh, you know, right. And so thinking through questions like whose data is it? What data are we talking about? What are the obligations of companies? And hopefully we can dig a little bit more into that as we go. Um, but I think for us, we really see it as not only obviously a legal obligation, <laughs> I mean, just to be clear, but beyond that really it's a way to build trust with people and to meet people's expectations. And so I think it just goes at, along with the bundle of rights that people have come to expect. And if we aren't providing transparency, if we aren't providing control to people over how their data is used, and if we aren't allowing them to access and port their data, then we're not, we're not fulfilling that trusted relationship. And so I think it's just part for Meta, it's part of our privacy program, it's part of our approach to privacy to put people at the center and to give them control over their data. Um, and I think we've been really delighted to see the, the depth of the conversations and DTI's work and where um, industry is going in terms of fleshing out some of those trickier questions around obligations um, for companies around data portability. Um, for, forgive me, Chris, I'm just going to skip over and ask Kate this, the same question because I think I want to get a baseline before we, we move on. You, um, you mentioned sort of the trusted relationship uh, from the meta perspective. Google also have been, again, from what I can remember, offering some form of data portability for a long time uh, to, to a degree. Um, uh, the question why seems a bit binary, but sort of from Google's perspective, what, is that also similar about trust? Is, is there a business case for Google itself in doing this? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have been um, offering portability tools since 2011. Um, we had a group of engineers in our Chicago office um, as early as uh, 2007 
um, pulling together the foundations of that product. And um, by 2011, that had turned into uh, Google Takeout, uh, which everybody you know, can still access and use today. Um, today it has um, 80 products, 80 Google products and service are available uh, for takeout. Um, so this has been something we've been investing in for a very long time. Um, the reason really is about user choice. And it's very simple, kind of straightforward for us, which is the user comes first. And that's always been guiding Google writ large. Um, and I think that shines through when it comes to the question of data portability as well. Um, I think you know there's a couple reasons, more much more specifically. So user trust and confidence, uh, same as Melinda said, user trust, user control is really at the heart of our privacy practice, and data portability offers that uh, a user can understand and know and have control over how their data is used. There's a transparency value too because Google Takeout, these portability tools, allow a user to have visibility and transparency, in our case, on what data is in their Google account. So it's a visibility and transparency tool. Um, it's also confidence for us. It's as a business, we want to know that our products are the best products you know, we can offer. And so the availability, the ability of the user choice um, uh, is a signal to us and it helps show us uh, whether that's the case. Um, and I think as an ecosystem writ large, when users have choice and they can act on that choice, it is better for everybody, both the business and the users, because um, it, um, it means that they're, they're using the best products and they're able to, uh, to, to move and use the best products and that promotes competition and innovation in the ecosystem, which overall is a good thing. Chris, I'm, I'm going to put you on a tight spot and ask you to be a proxy for everyone else. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> I, I see the, the trust and I see the competition to the, the, the quintessential, the only competition is only one click away argument. Um, we haven't seen arguably much of a shift, I would argue, in terms of that uh, sort of the incumbent challenges that, you know, technically data portability can offer. Uh, from your discussions with others who have looked at this, both the big and the small, how do you take um, what, say, Metro and Google are doing and then provide that choice in, in a practical way? What is it, what is it, what's in it for, say, a, a, um, an upstart, a startup, if you will, who wants to get into the space can potentially get their um, users to provide this data via sort of the Google Meta services? Like, what does that mean for them? Well, I think there's a few different layers to that. One of them is the uh, premise that the data transfer project is a collaborative effort uh, several years ago that both Google and Meta were involved with was founded on, which is that it, the more uh, straightforward and simple you can make it for users to actually transfer their data, the more it will become an opportunity and it will become something that smaller entrants can, can look and see you know, we can really add users more effectively by giving them ways to bring their data in. Um, you're right, it's still new, it's still nascent. Uh, there's these little uh, cards scattered on the tables here and in the next room. These were uh, my portability predictions for 2024. So if you don't like any of them, blame me. Uh, but on one of them, it, it calls out very specifically that the, the sort of supply demand equation for portability is still greater on the supply side than it is on the demand side. People don't really know that they can move their data. People still feel trapped. It's one of the things that DTI as an organization is very much working on. And a corollary of that, small businesses have opportunities to find business value in helping users bring their data in. And we haven't unlocked that really yet. I believe it is there, I very strongly believe that is there. And I've been talking to people all around the world. Um, probably it won't surprise anyone a little bit more in Europe than here in the United States. Uh, but that opportunity, I think, is very much there. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll give a brief uh, plug, which I know is strange to do at my event. Um, but on Tuesday of next week, I'm going to be moderating a discussion at Brussels to the Bay out in San Francisco that the European Commission's uh, San Francisco delegation is putting on. And this will come up there as well. We'll have some people there sort of asking these interesting questions of, 
where is the investment opportunity? Where is the entrepreneurship opportunity? And of course, I see data portability among the pieces of the DMA as one that really will create that value. So it's, it's not there yet. I think it's coming, and I think it's coming not just for the reasons that Melinda and Kate noted, that users are starting to expect it more and more. That is also growing. I've had conversations with non-gatekeeper, non-large companies who recognize that when Google, Meta, Apple, Amazon, others build these features and these tools directly into their systems, if they don't also offer them, they start to look like they're trapping their users. And it's a, it's a bad look. There's market pressure building, I think, universally to offer this a little bit more. And, and the final point I want to make, this is so core to the value system of the internet itself. Right? It's not just about users and user rights. It's that this is, this is the internet we're talking about. The data should be able to be moved. It should flow. And I think that that is felt. Maybe it's not always verbalized, which is why I wanted to call it out. But I think it's felt as part of this as well. I, I want to go back to the previous panel. And forgive me, I'm not sure who of the panelists had a um, sort of um, breakdown of the type of portability offerings available and the, the pros and the cons. One seem to come through is there is no silver bullet here, right? And so uh, the offerings that you guys have, that Meta and Google have been offering are legitimately there. They're, they allow me as a user to, to, to do things, but they all come with downside risks. Uh, downside, downsides, not maybe risks. That is both for me and also those who I want to pretend maybe provide that data to as, a, as an alternative. Can I just ask, we're, and we'll get into the DMA and standards going forward, but just ask to respond to the la last panel and that, sh that um, breakdown, specifically looking at there is no silver bullet, there is always limitations and um, pros and cons to, to providing this data portability, particularly from, as Coben said, there's a privacy element to this too. Uh, maybe start with the UK. How do you balance that out in terms of, yes, you need to, there's a legal requirement, yes, there's a trust issue with users, but there's also, by no means, uh, you can't offer everything to everyone at the same time. Yeah, and I, I think privacy and security is one of the biggest issues and, and challenges to make sure that in the process of offering this right and, and meeting this right, meeting the requirements and the legislation, that that can be done in a way that really preserves security and, um, and, and privacy. So, um, you know, one of the issues around privacy, right, is that um, um, when a user is agreeing to transfer their data, that they very clearly know who they're transferring, transferring that data to, um, how that data is going to be used, what specific data is being transferred, and so I think um, some of that can be around, you know, policies. Um, so, for example, in the, um, the the API, the developer API that we're, you know, de developing, um, uh, uh, there's you know very specific policies about how um, you know privacy needs to look, and it, it, it's really important to be able to have those requirements and and those expectations. Um, I think on the security side. There's a whole range of ways you can secure, um, uh, you know, enhance security and, and portability, and that's one of the most important things to preserve user trust. So whether that's ensuring that the data is encrypted in transit, um, re-authenticating an account uh, before, you know, when a request is made for takeout in Google Takeout, for example, making sure that you re-authenticate and that you have the, the, the right person. For folks in Google who are using the Advanced um, Protection Program, which is our elevated level of uh, protection for higher risk individuals, will have a delay uh, before they're able to um, uh, take out uh, their, their data so that um, the notifications to that individual, notifications um, to, through various methods, um, uh, uh, make sure to reach in case it's actually an unauthorized actor um, attempting to um, uh, 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 take out that, that data. So um, it really needs to be a f an area of uh, focus attention and regulation needs to make sure that it's um, that, that, that the privacy and security elements of this are, are able to, um, to really be um, implemented. 
Could I jump in on that as well, Mark, before you go, have a question? Go for it. Absolutely. Uh, so I think this is one of the points in intention that we have when you have a legal instrument like the DMA that is taking effect and requiring specific things to be done, while at the same time that law is not fully specific in how they are to be done. Right? And, and uh, as, as I said, forgive me for being a little bit trite, but I think in many ways this is a feature, not a bug of the law. Right? We are at a let, the, let a thousand flowers bloom kind of an era for implementing portability, and that's a good thing because we can learn from experimentation, from these different approaches. We just need to sort of let that process and let these different ways have their time. And, and the end state is not one form of portability. It's, it's a set with different criteria, and we will sort of all guide the evolution of this ecosystem together, I hope. My, my counter to that would be you can't play around with fundamental rights. And, and therefore, as much as I get the thousand flowers blooming, that's one thing when you're looking at the fundamental charter in the EU. Um, just in terms of the, the meta um, balance between security privacy and the data portability function. Yeah, I mean, I would echo everything that Kate said, and I think what we're seeing is the data portability, we're, we're kind of, it, it's being used in data privacy and it's being used in competition. And, you know, we're seeing this in a lot of regulatory areas, particularly in the EU, where different regulators are using the same tools. And so you're kind of caught, caught between the policy objectives. Um, and so I do think that that's why the ecosystem approach is, is critical to align on these solutions. But the other thing I would say about portability is I think we really need to, it is not a silver bullet, it is not one thing, and we really need to keep the user at the center of this. So I think it's a rare case probably that you go to one service and say, I want to take everything and plug it into this other service. What's more likely is I want to take, I want to have a backup for my photos. I want to have my posts saved because I just want to remember them, right? And so we have to not think of it as a monolith that will always look the same for every service or, you know, that people are always going to be taking everything to another place, but that it needs to be granular and really broken down by data type and think about the use cases. And I think we all know in our lives that we use lots of different apps for lots of different things and so, and we use them differently. Um, and so I think we have to keep that nuance and the focus on the user and how she's going to use portability. The, the last panel, uh, other than being incredibly uh, helpful, uh, try to get a hashtag trending. Uh, and I think ahead of the DMA enforcement date of March 6th, I want to get DMA enforcement day going if anyone wants to join me. Uh, I don't think it's going to work, but I can, uh, I can try. Um, it's coming. I remain massively scared skeptical about how it's going to go. Uh, to give uh, our Meadow and Google colleagues a little bit of time to think about this, I'm going to turn to you, Chris, first, about how the others may be approaching it, particularly maybe a fruit-based tech company, uh, and how you see the, um, the wider corporate response to the DMA going. And then I'll come to the, the two panelists from the, the companies. Thank you. Well, I mean, the obligations of the DMA focus only on six companies, right? So while everyone in the ecosystem is paying attention to it, because the burden is concentrated on a few, it, it, will, it will change the nature of the day and, and how uh, these laws are, are, are challenged and put into place and, and implemented and so forth. The, the, the high-level point that I want to make here is I have seen more collaboration, more outreach, more partnership uh, with the, the designated gatekeepers in the build-up to this effective date than, than some might have expected, right? The commission has been a bit open. They have had conversations. They have had workshops. They have more workshops coming up next week, one on each of the six designated gatekeepers to sort of talk about this and to socialize this. And uh, I, I hope that there aren't um, anything in the way of sort of weird gotchas or gimmies or surprises. And, and I don't think there will be. I think that there's a um, maybe more of a sense of collaboration and a shared uh, investment in getting this done right than one might have said. So while I certainly understand cynicism and skepticism, and I do think a lot of things are not going to work the way any of us had envisioned or had hoped on March 7th, I think that we're in it together and I think that we can work on it together to improve it from there. I'm going to do you first, Melinda, because again, I picked on Kate first the last time. It only seems fair to go back and forward. From Meta's perspective, again, if you want to spill the beans about what, how you're going to do this at scale, <laughs> we're all over, ready to listen to you. But 
Um, just in general, if you can, what do you think is going to change or in terms of how you, pro you know, provide those services and meet the obligations? Yeah, I mean, if this event if this event were happening in a couple of weeks, we might have more to share. I think the timing's a little unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. But um, look, I mean, we've had our tools download your information and transfer your information for years. Those are our you know our offerings in this space, um, and so I think we'll have more to share in in the coming weeks. But I think the the aspect of the DMA around real time and continuous sharing of information is, is, is a question that we all need to think through of what that means, what are consumer expectations of that, how is that possible, what is the infrastructure that supports that. And so I do think the, the DMA day is the start um, and not the end, or maybe it's the midpoint of the, of the conversation. Um, and there's still a lot of work to be done for sure. To um, maybe you just build, build on that. Um, Chris mentioned that the sort of the cooperation or workshopping that the commission has done, did, from a Google perspective, has, has that been useful? Uh, it feels like other than previous iterations of regulation, Brussels has been a bit more open on the DMA and how they interact with the companies. Um, would that be fair from, from Google's yeah, perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think we've been working on compliance with a lot of transparency and engagement and partnership. So um, I think that's, um, that's been good. Um, I too won't get ahead of my colleagues next week on uh, compliance, but um, you know, again, we've been offering these products for over a decade. Um, one of the things that we have rolled out, um, early testing starting in uh, January for our DMA compliance has been a, um, a developer API for data portability. Um, so um, that has been, uh, yeah, in, in beta test since uh, January. So I think we are really um, applying compliance with, uh, you know, approaching compliance with this sort of transparency to um, uh, to, to meet the intent and to work with um, uh, and make product changes. Um, I think when you look back at the at the theme and the goal of data portability, which is user choice. Um, I think that overall, some of the D DMA policies are, you know, they're, they're new, they're fairly untested, and uh, we do have some concerns that the overall effect will, in some cases, be to uh, limit user choice. Um, we've seen a little bit of that um, emerging in, 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 in some of the um, last, last few months as the testing uh, has, has gone forward. I always find it interesting talking to U.S. audiences about this because I think from a U.S. perspective, a rule is a rule, but from Europe, a rule is a guideline. And, and, that's, it's a, and that, I think, is something that we're going to see in terms of the rule comes in, but you, it, we're not going to see it for the next two, three years before we, we, we only see what the rules actually look like. Um, but I want to build on Melinda's point about the real-time continuous implementation as a thorny issue or again, my word, not, not matters. Um, from Google's perspective, where do you see potential hurdles in the road going forward? Again, not to look at compliance, but just sort of the complexity of, of how this is going to be implemented. Where do you see uh, work need, needing to be done? Yeah, I mean, privacy and security obviously jumps out there, um, just as it does more more generally, and making sure as um, developers do access the API and and um, so, you know, developers can ask users to consent to sharing their um, data directly and um, making sure that those requests have the right kind of information around consent, around um, how the data will be used, around understanding who will um, uh, see it and that it's done uh, securely. I think um, those issues are, are going to rise, um, you know, to the forefront. Maybe a bit more broadly, some of the issues, you know, I don't know, this may be another part of the conversation, but um, questions around formatting and user expectations and, um, you know, how you, how you match what a user thinks when they're transferring that data. It's, there's a lot of complexities. There's a lot of differences in how different companies use different, you know, parts of, um, you know, the data that, that could be transferred. And so I think there's going to be a lot of work on, um, uh, you know, how to align with what users expect when they think they're transferring their data and how that actually manifests going from product to, to product. And that's probably something worth digging into later. Can I add on that very briefly? 
Go for it. And also comment uh, or call out to Melinda's point earlier about the different ways in which personal data is used, right? Some personal data is made available. Social media posts publicly available through a URL in many services and contexts. Other personal data is private photos that are only shared with family members and others. And, and so understanding that sort of differentiation in user expectations and uses and how that factors in to the various parameters that will be associated with continuous and real time, it's all in service of protecting the user and empowering the user and ensuring that the user's expectations and intent are being met. But it will result in a, a sort of a diversity of implementations and approaches, particularly at the beginning. And again, that's a good thing. And I'm going to do a shout out back to the paper from Chinmay Sharma, which if you haven't already downloaded it from the agenda page, goes into some depth on some different ways of doing this. And then a shout out forward to Chan's paper in the afternoon block, Stick Around, which is going to be a deep dive on webhooks as one particular way in many contexts that this could be implemented um, in, a, in a useful and an interesting way. I want to move on to uh, again, not to be the doom monger, but some of the challenges around this. Um, I refer to the last panel where we had sort of competition, content moderation, and privacy as a nexus of how this all may work, all of which have levers to pull and pros and cons to, to everything. I, I'm going to focus on a word that Chris used when we were discussing how to frame this uh, panel around bad actors, define that how you wish, but in terms of privacy, content moderation, and even competition, there are people who would like to um, use these for uh, these um, data portability for potentially nefarious reasons for whatever they are. How do you meet your expectations both to your users and also frankly to the law while also, I mean, I think you mentioned this a little bit about security, but while also making sure those bad actors, whoever they meet on, on privacy competition or, or content uh, are kept at bay, but while also meeting the requirements that you have to meet. Uh, again, it feels, I asked Melinda the last time, so Kate, I'm going to turn to you yeah, first. I mean, um, I mean, it's in many ways, it's, it's the same way we do a lot of this, is you have very clear policies and you have the ability to, you know, enforce those policies as, as um, you know, best you can. So um, certainly we have those um, guidelines when it comes to the, um, you know, the, the API. But I think it is a concern when you look at legislation in the space and different pieces of draft legislation around um, the world that there is space for that kind of decision making and not that, you know, you just, you have to hand it over with, with no kind of standards, um, uh, which is where I think the, um, uh, the greatest risk rests. I'm going to show my European bias, and I don't mean to knock uh, DC, but if there was comprehensive privacy rules here, I, I would reference them. <laughs> um, so that's, that was not supposed to be a joke, but okay, there we go. Um, how, this is, this um, is a bit of a nexus between privacy and competition, right? Like, you, we need choice, um, apparently, uh, to, to, for, for users, but we also have a expectation if you take GDPR as a global de facto standard, some, some privacy rights baked in. Uh, for, for Meta, there is a balance there, and sometimes they are uh, counterfactual and they play against each other. So I, I just want to drill in the, into this a little bit with, with what's coming next week. There is a balance to be met, but that balance is inherently difficult and even potentially hard to even reach. So how, how do you look, how does Meta look at the requirements from the privacy standpoint, but also now both what you do already, but the legal requirements are going to be coming in by the Europeans to meet the data portability expectations. So not, not to defend the U.S. approach too much, but I will say even if there were comprehensive privacy legislation, which there absolutely should be in the U.S., uh, it wouldn't necessarily set out the rules that we're talking about and the clarity, you know, so we've called for portability legislation for, for years now to exactly drill down into these questions about who's liable if you transfer it to a third party that turns out to be a bad actor. So I just want to, I want to <laughs> clarify that point. We need, we do need more legislation, but beyond just comprehensive privacy. Um, so on the, on the data and competition bit, I mean, I think that, um, it, we're still figuring it out, right? I mean, there, there, we have these competing demands on privacy, but the mandate uh, under the DMA also on portability and interoperability. And so um, I don't think it's it's going to be a balancing approach as, as everything is. I, I, what I would press on is I think it's not... Um, 
you know, minds disagree about whether a uh, data portability right is a, is the, the, a bespoke competition remedy, right? Data is non rivalrous you, you know, it, it's not locked up necessarily in one place or another. And so while I do think data portability is a good goal um, in general, I think that what we're going to see is whether it's a meaningful competition um, remedy. And so and I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the DMA compliance plays out. Um, and whether this is an approach that others are going to adopt as a, as a competition remedy, um, because I think, you know, there's kind of research on both sides saying <laughs> whether this is, this is fit for purpose as a competition um, approach. So very interested to see how it, how it plays out. And, you know, we do see some other countries beyond the EU adopting kind of DMA copycats or seeking to. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll see where this is, where this is going. I want to jump in here with a little bit of a plug, but this trust building question and portability questions and collaborations are not just going to happen within the EU, but even within the EU, we hope to encourage alignment around at least the spirits of these trust building processes so that Mark's awesome photo sharing app or maps for short doesn't have to go through several different gauntlets to try to establish trust with all of the different photo sharing services in the world at the very least will have some consistency across those so that you can reuse some of the work that you show that you are you know, based in the European Union, that of course, therefore, you're compliant with the GDPR and that sort of thing. So DTI has been having stakeholder calls and conversations for the past few months. And next week, we're going to release a, uh, a report on this with a, an appendix of a sample trust model that gives examples of the kinds of questions and the kinds of information to try to gather to establish trust in a way that doesn't reintroduce uh, closed walls and silos and, and, and boundaries in this. So stay tuned, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media, and expect that next week. Sorry, had to plug. That's a, that's a lot of plugs in, yes. in, in an hour. Um, I want to borrow from Zeev for a second and, and mention Gen AI, because again, that gets everyone's attention. So I'm, thanks for that. I'm going to steal that from going forward. Um, recently, we saw a variety of voluntary commitments from the companies, uh, both um, here in the US in July and also at the Munich Security Conference around specifically electoral-related AI issues um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, it feels that the, sort of the, there is a um, movement, at least in the Gen AI space, for voluntary commitments and co-regulation. Um, this is kind of a bit of a free hit for you all because you are doing it right now. But I, I do think in terms of waiting for regulators to act is too slow and cross company cooperation, open source options, which frankly you guys are doing, seems like a way to get the ball rolling when you know it's going to be coming. Can I just ask, how do you do that at scale? Right? Because again, I think you mentioned the non rivalness nature of, of data to a degree. The com companies compete, but they're also doing it voluntarily together is sometimes an easier option and faster option and um, iterate option than waiting for regulators to slap down uh, suggestions and demands. So uh, I'm, uh, you're nodding, so I'm just going to ask you to sort of work me through what that looks like in terms of being able to share best practice, work with your uh, counterparts at the other companies to make sure this can work. I can move my data to X, Y, and Z and not have to wait around for regulators to lay down what should happen. Yeah. So I think this is something that we've invested in for years and, and with the data transfer project and, you know, signing up with partners um, years ago. And so I think we have really invested in that over time um, because unlike some other policy issues, this is actually also a technical issue, right? So, so everyone needs to be on the same page. So I think maybe because of that, because it is a technical issue that maybe it's a little easier to get folks together around it. Um, whereas if it's just a policy issue, maybe it's a little easier to wait for, for regulation. Um, so I think it's actually pretty unique as a, as a policy issue in that way. Um, and I think it's the same with kind of content standards and Gen AI for what it's worth. It's a technical issue um, in, in some ways. And so people have to, companies have to work together around it. So I don't think it's been a, a pretty hard sell um, so far, yeah. Chris, can I ask you to put on your uh, sort of startup hoodie for a second and put yourself in a, into the, the shoes of, of someone who's wanted to get a company getting into the space, wants to engage, but is frankly a team of five with you know, limited funds and is frankly building a product and can't spend time in conference calls or even engaging with DTI. How do they, 
stay on top of this and, and be part of that sort of cross-company option to, on the tech, technical side of it, while also, frankly, running a business and competing? I don't have all the answers to that. I will say that a lot of that, I am excited for the future of more and more partnerships with groups like Allied for Startups, who's represented over here. We've got Michael from the Allied for Startups team. I also have a good team in Brussels. Uh, uh, Tom Fish uh, has a, a group called the Coalition for Online Data Empowerment, or CODE. There's two things called CODE now. Uh, but codepolicy.org is working with some groups in the UK EU space to sort of be a, 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 an inter interlocutor between some of these smaller organizations and some of the larger ones. And I think that just from a scaling perspective, no startup should have to dedicate a lot of time or manpower to figuring this out. And, and you need to have uh, a representation layer uh, in between them and this in order to try to facilitate that. So I, I think that's the only scalable solution. Okay, okay, can I just ask in terms of moving beyond the sort of company-led, voluntary-led element, is there a role for like international standards to do this? Do we need sort of an ISO standard of data portability to get this going? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely a role for, for standards. Um, there's a lot of work for, ahead on um, standards. I mean, so some of the ones that exist um, today, you know, the V card or the contacts or calendars, like it's very easy to, to know how to, um, you know, um, do portability for some of those formats. But they are so fast moving that the standards need to be able to like, allow for that interchangeable formatting, but also allow for innovation and, and, and change. So I mean, one example of this is on contacts, right? There's a very clear kind of standard for contacts. But if somebody wants to add an avatar, um, you know, that's something new that's not in the standard, right? And so people, you have to be able to innovate on the product and make that a good product experience without necessarily like bringing it down to the lowest common denominator um, type of um, product. Um, this is where kind of user user interest right comes to the forefront in, in decision making. Like there's a lot of user interest, whether it's in you know photos or calendars or contacts. There's been less interest in something like maps directions. So the standard doesn't exist for how to transfer maps directions right now, and that clearly is is something that you know needs needs work over over time. I think if I could add very briefly to that, one of the uh, one of the strengths of the data transfer project uh, as as a, as a technology framework is it's open source. We maintain an open source repo. It's on GitHub. Uh, we have representations of the data models that we use for DTP powered transfer tools offered by Google and Meta and Apple and others, and and so there's there's a there's a nice transparency and visibility there, and also an invitation. Right, if, if there's an organization that wants to come in and, and take a look at the code and talk to us and make some suggestions or some ideas, we, we're here, we're open to that. We're, we're eager to sort of explore those frontiers a little bit more and, and, uh, and there's a framework for that. So I'm gonna open up the Q&A in about five minutes. I'm also conscious that people are hungry and lunch is waiting, so uh, uh, we'll get to the, the lunch in a minute. Uh, I wanna finish this part of the, the panel just on international cooperation. I'm gonna sort of try and de-Europeanify myself a little bit and look at you know, elsewhere where these type of elements are picking up, um, sort of DMA style, if not sort of data, data portability regulation or um, proposals. There's a lot to unpack, and it's difficult for a Brazil or a South Africa to align with whatever the Europeans are doing, whatever the US may or may not do in the future. As a sort of as a company, uh, how do you approach that? I mean, obviously, engagement, trying to promote best practice makes sense, but are you concerned at all that you'll end up having different data portability regimes popping up in different areas that won't be interoperable, and then you end up you know, having sort of whack-a-mole where you're trying to meet all the expectations, but not meeting all of them at the same time? Yes. <laughs> um, but, I, but actually, I think the bigger concern is potentially around, I mean, the DMA exists in a very specific legislative context in the EU. Um, it is one piece among many. Um, and although they all of the pieces, the, the big marquee pieces of legislation don't necessarily talk to each other as well as they should, that's the intention. And I think our bigger concern is that other companies want to 
have what Europe has, and other countries want to have what Europe has, and we'll just cut and paste. And it doesn't work necessarily in that context. If you don't have the GDPR counterpart already, if you don't have the other European laws that the DMA sits on top of. So I think that is something that, you know, GDPR was something that was basically cut and pasted around the world, um, which worked okay because in a lot of places, for example, in LATAM or other, you know, regions of the world that they already had data protection laws in place, there was a foundation to build on. This is new. This is a complete sea change in competition regulation um, that doesn't exist. And so I think it's going to be a bit of a painful process. I think other countries are going to look and see if it works in Europe. I think um, Europe has, has um, no offense. Uh, <laughs> None taken as the token European. Yeah, yeah. Uh, has built a bit of a bloated uh, regulatory world now, and I think um, there's some voices are now becoming more prominent. Say, let's not jump into all this. Let's see how it plays out. This isn't. We're not necessarily where we were with GDPR to just say let's copy it all and that's the way forward. I think the real. Um, the, the effect and the drag on innovation is going to be real, um, and folks are concerned about that rightly. So I think other countries may wait and see what happens. Kate? Yeah, um, similarly, I think regulatory fragmentation, and this, of course, goes from a global perspective as well as fragmentation between you know different fields, privacy, competition, others, is, is a, a huge concern. Um, you know, we support the ambitions of the DMA, but we should remember that it is a novel and untested policy, and it um, could have unintended consequences and trade-offs. Um, I think one of those, um, you know, uh, an example of one of those is um, uh, the hotels. The hotel uh, have recently tweeted that in the testing phase, they've seen a 30% drop-off uh, to direct hotel suppliers of clicks um, uh, in, in, in where you know, a lot of that is now going to aggregators as opposed to direct suppliers like hotels. Um, and so I think we really need to watch and look at how this um, uh, plays out and learn from it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's the right um, kind of ambition, but I, I think we just need to, to be learning um, as, as, as other you know, countries and geographies are thinking about this. So as a journalist, I could ask questions for days, but no one wants to hear my voice forever. Um, I'm going to open up the Q&A. Uh, who would like to ask the panel some questions? The gentleman at the front, thank you. I'm Michael Nelson with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And work on tech policy and also do a lot of work with our East Asia team. We're releasing a report today on digital leadership and particularly how in country after country, we're seeing different agencies pursuing different policies at the same time. And nobody providing the leadership to force people to really ask what do they really want so that we can have unambiguous legislation. We gave report cards to four countries. We did not try to give a report card to, to, to Brussels. But as I look at the recent legislation, the Data Act, the AI Act, I see a total lack of digital leadership. I see people writing these pieces of legislation that are a wish list. We want you to give us total transparency, but total privacy. We want you know, control over the data, but we want everybody to access it. I mean, it's just, on the face of it, it's legislative malpractice. So I guess I'd ask each of you to, uh, including our European, what letter grade would you give for the recent <laughs> data-related bills in the EU? So I'm gonna give that to Chris. <laughs> oh. Uh, I'm not going to put a grade on it either. I think that there. Yeah, I'll give. I'll give it a grade. I just feel sure. like give you guys give you an op yeah. opportunity for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think the main the main thing I want to say is that we 
we'll always be in a worse off place if we are looking solely to governments to provide leadership, right? This is something that we need to be doing collectively. We need to have others coming together. In that sense, I think the EU is making some positive steps forward because of this collaboration that we referenced earlier in this panel, because of the fact that they are encouraging of DTI and our work in this little corner of one of the several laws that the EU is putting forward. And granted, it's a very broad field, and the degree of collaboration across that broad field is highly variable, but this is an event on data portability where I think collaboration is at, at a peak and where I, I think we do see, at least collectively, some really valuable leadership that I, I hope will also extend to the portability regulations in Korea that are developing this year and anything else that happens in other regions as well. As, again, I'll be the token European again. Uh, I think I would give GDPRC C can you hear me? Yeah. Um, purely because um, it's taken five years to get where we are, and as many as the fines, even to some of the, uh, my colleagues on the panel, they haven't really changed much for a consumer. I think the back end of the companies has changed significantly. Do, do people look at their data differently? They do not. So in terms of affecting change from a consumer perspective, it's been a failure. Uh, I think the, the litany of uh, acronyms that we've had, DSA, uh, DMA, Data Act, DGA, you know, whatever the other ones are, AI Act now, um, we don't know. They haven't come in yet. Uh, I think the DSA as it stands right now, which is the one that's come in as of last month, this month, it's a massive uh, work in progress, mostly because there's no resource, both personnel and res money to, to put into it. The DMA is similar. There's a, the commission team for DMA is 50 people. Um, compare that to what the DFTC and DOJ have let alone looking at the ex-ante regulation it involves, it's, that's, a, that's a hard lift. Um, I think we need to look at the European perspective from a three to five year horizon. That doesn't help the companies on the panel because they, they're gonna get slapped with investigations now. But I think in terms of the leadership you're looking at, it's, it's a midterm uh, objective, but I don't think we can give them a, uh, a mark right now. Thank you very much. And I, I would say you're an even harsher grader than I am. <laughs> given Brussels a B and now they're moving to a D. The U.S. is still an incomplete. Well, the U.S. isn't even playing, so. <laughs> and I would point to uh, India, which, although I don't like the policy, it's B+. Plus. Could you use a microphone because we need to live stream it. Okay. Um, one final question before lunch. Who's going to take on the, uh, the corner? Oh, two. Excellent. Gentleman at the front. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't want to ask it, but now I will because the floor was open. Uh, some of the conversations you had are very similar to the ones we had in the solid uh, group. Now, it's easy to blame, you know, things on a large company or another. The question is, in the context of leadership, what can users or NGOs, uh, what can we do to help these companies and help the governance uh, part? to make more progress on this uh, digital rights movement. And I'll ask, uh, it, it, Kate. I mean, uh, Chris said it, right? It, ta it takes at least two. So I think we are the other side of the two. Kate? I mean, I'll take it, but I think Chris, you know, I mean, the very purpose of DTI is to grow this community and to, you know, to, um, you know, to enable and expand the participation in the data portability um, uh, world. So I think as NGOs and as partners and as companies, um, the more people we can have involved in this conversation and participating in, in um, data portability, I think the better, but maybe you have more. And on that uplifting note, I think we're going to call the panel. Thank you so much for participating. I hope you enjoyed it. And I believe lunch is being served. Thank you. <laughs>